and had the assurance, the firm belief, that the coming of the Messiah was very near, and that she herself would be of the number of his relatives, according to the flesh. Her prayer was continuous, and she constantly aimed at greater purity. It had been revealed to her that she was to bring forth a child of benediction. Her firstborn daughter, who had remained with her grandfather, Eliud, Anne recognized and loved as her own and Joachim's child, but she felt certain that she was not the child whom, by interior enlightenment, she knew that she was to bear. For nineteen years and five months after the birth of this first child, Joachim and Anne were childless. They lived in continued prayer and sacrifice, in mortification and continency. I frequently saw them dividing their herds, which rapidly multiplied again. Joachim often remained far away with his flocks in humble supplication to God. The anxiety of both and their longing after the promised blessing had reached their height. Many of their acquaintances upbraided them because of their sterility, which they attributed to some wickedness. They said that the child living with Eliud was not really Anne's daughter. Otherwise, she would have it with her. When Joachim, absent with the herds, went again to the temple to offer sacrifice, Anne used to send servants out to the fields to him with numbers of things, doves and other birds in baskets and cages. Joachim loaded two asses from the meadow with them. Also, with three little long-necked animals, white and nimble, and lambs and kids in wicker baskets. He carried a lantern at the end of a stick. It looked like a light in a scooped-out gourd. Gourd. I saw him with his offerings journeying over a beautiful green field between Bethania and Jerusalem. I often saw Jesus in the same spot. Toward evening, Joachim reached the temple. The asses were stabled in the same place as subsequently at Mary's presentation, and the offerings were carried up the steps of the mount that led to the temple. When they had been received by the attendants, Joachim's servants returned while he himself went on into the hall in which were the water basins for the cleansing of the gifts. Thence he passed through a long corridor to a hall upon the left of the sanctuary where were, where were the altar of incense, the table of showbread, and the seven-branched candlestick. The hall was filled with those that had brought offerings. Joachim was received in a very contemptuous manner by a priest named Reuben, who would scarcely admit him. He was shoved into a corner behind a grating, and his offerings were not like those of others, conspicuously placed behind the gratings to the right of the courtyard, but indifferently set on one side. The priests were around the altar of incense upon which an offering was being made. Lamps were burning, and lights were lit on the seven-branched candlestick, but not all seven at once. I have often noticed that different arms of the candlestick were lighted on different occasions. I saw Joachim leaving the temple in great trouble. He went from Jerusalem through Bethania and into the country of Macarus, where he sought consolation in the house of an Essenian. The prophet Manahem had once dwelt here, and also in the family of an Essenian at Bethania. This prophet had foretold to Herod, while still a child, his future kingdom and wickedness. From this place, Joachim went to his most distant herds on Mount Hermon. The way led through the wilderness of Gadi and over the Jordan. Hermon is a long, narrow, unbroken mountain, whose sunny side is green and blooming when the other is still covered with snow. Joachim was so dejected, so mortified, that he would not allow his people to inform Anne where he was staying. 
while the trouble of the latter when she heard how things had gone at the temple and saw that Joachim did not return home was indescribable. Joachim was so dejected, so mortified, that he would not allow his people to inform Anne where he was staying, while the trouble of the latter, when she heard how things had gone at the temple and saw that Joachim did not return home, was indescribable. For five months, Joachim thus remained in concealment on Hermon. I saw him praying and weeping. When he went to look after his flocks and his lambs, he was often so overcome by sadness that he cast himself with covered face prostrate on the ground. His servants questioned him upon the cause of his grief, but he did not tell them that it was because he was childless. Again he divided his magnificent herds into three parts, the best he sent to the temple, the second to the Essenians, and the least he kept for himself. Anne, in the midst of her anxiety, had much to endure also from an insolent maid servant who bitterly taunted her with her sterility. She bore with her a long time, but at last she sent her from the house. The maid had requested permission to go to a feast. This was not in accordance with the strict discipline of the Essenians. Anne refused the permission, and then the maid reproached her, telling her that she deserved to be sterile and abandoned by her husband on account of her harsh and unreasonable temper. Then Anne sent her with gifts and, accompanied by two servants, back to her parents, that they might receive her safe and sound as she had come to her. She sent them also the message that she should know she sent them also the message that she could no longer take charge of their daughter. After the girl's departure, Anne went in sadness to her chamber and prayed. When evening closed, she threw a long scarf over her head and enveloped herself entirely in it, took a covered light beneath her mantle, went out under a spreading tree that stood in the courtyard, lit the lamp, and prayed. This tree was one of those whose branches strike root again and again, and thus form a whole tract of covered walk under their foliage. Its leaves are very large. I think it was with such that Adam and Eve clothed themselves in paradise. The whole tree had the characteristics of that of the forbidden fruit. The pear-shaped fruit hung usually in fives at the end of the branches. It was fleshy inside, with blood-colored veins. In its center was a hollow space in which reposed the kernel. The Jews made use of the large leaves chiefly at the Feast of tabernacles. They adorned the walls with them, laying them like the scales of a fish, so that their edges closely fitted together. The tree was surrounded by groves and seats. When Anne had long besought God not to separate her from Joachim, her pious husband, although he had been pleased to deprive her of children, an angel appeared to her. He hovered above her in the air, he told her to set her heart at rest. For the Lord had heard her prayer, that she should on the following morning go with two of her maidservants to the temple of Jerusalem, that there under the golden gate, entering by the side of the valley of Josaphat, she should meet Joachim, who was even now on his way thither, thither that Joachim's offerings would be accepted, that his prayer would be heard, that he, the angel, had appeared also to him. The angel likewise directed Anne to take some doves with her as an offering and promised that the name of the child she was soon to conceive should be made known to her. Anne thanked the Lord and returned to the house. When, after her lengthy prayer, she lay on her couch asleep, I saw light descending upon her. It surrounded her. Yes, even penetrated her. I saw her upon an interior perception, trembling, tremblingly awake and sit upright. Near her to the right she saw a luminous figure writing on the wall in large, shining Hebrew characters. I read and understood the writing word for word. 
It was to this effect that she should conceive that the fruit of her womb should be altogether special, and that the blessing received by Abraham was to be the source of this conception. I saw Anne's anxiety as to how she should communicate all that to Joachim, but the angel reassured her by telling her of Joachim's vision. I received then a clear explanation of Mary's immaculate conception. I saw that, in the Ark of the Covenant, a sacrament of the Incarnation of the Immaculate Conception, a mystery for the restoration of fallen humanity, was contained. I saw Anne, with surprise and joy, reading the red and golden letters of this luminous writing. Her gladness increased to such a degree that, when she arose to set out for Jerusalem, she looked far younger than before. I saw on Anne's person at the instant the angel appeared to her a beam of light and in her a shining vessel. I cannot better describe it than by saying that it was like a cradle or a tabernacle which had been closed but was now opened and made ready to receive a holy thing. How wonderfully I saw this is not to be expressed, for I saw it as if it were the cradle of salvation for the whole human race and also a kind of sacred vessel, now opened, and the veil withdrawn, I saw it quite naturally. And also a kind of sacred vessel, now opened, and the veil withdrawn. I saw it quite naturally, as if one and the same holy thing. I saw, too, the apparition of the angel to Joachim. The angel commanded him to take his offering up to the temple, promised that his prayer should be heard and told him that he should pass under the golden gate. At this announcement, Joachim was troubled. He felt very timid about going again to the temple. But the angel assured him that the priests had already been enlightened with regard to him. It was the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Joachim and his shepherds had already erected their tabernacles. With a large herd of cattle as an offering, Joachim reached Jerusalem on the fourth day of the feast and put up near the temple. Anne arrived in Jerusalem also on the fourth day of the feast. She stopped with the family of Zacharias near the fish market and met Joachim for the first time only at the end of the feast. When Joachim approached the temple, two of the priests came out to meet him. They did this acting upon a divine inspiration. Joachim had brought with him two lambs and three kids. His offering was accepted, slaughtered, and burned at the customary place in the temple. But a part of it was taken and burned at another place to the right of the entrance porch, in the center of which stood the large teacher's desk. When the smoke arose, I saw a beam of light descend upon Joachim and the officiating priest. There was a pause. The beholders looked on in amazement, and I saw two priests go out to Joachim and lead him through the side apartments into the sanctuary before the altar of incense. Then the priests laid incense upon the altar, not in grains, but in the lump it kindled of itself. The priests immediately retired to a distance and left Joachim alone before the altar. I saw him on his knees, his arms extended, while the incense offering slowly consumed itself. He remained shut up in the temple all night, praying with great and ardent desires. I saw that he was in ecstasy. A luminous figure appeared to him in the same manner as to Zachary, and gave him a roll written in shining letters. On it were the three names, Helia, Hannah, Merjam. And near the last one, on the picture of a little Ark of the Covenant, or a tabernacle, Joachim laid the roll on his breast under his garment. The angel spoke, Anne will receive an immaculate child from whom the Redeemer of the world will be born. The angel told him, moreover, not to grieve over his sterility, which was not a disgrace to him, but a glory, for that was his spouse would conceive. The angel told him, moreover, not to grieve over his sterility, which was not a disgrace to him, but a glory.
for that what his spouse would conceive should not be from him, but through him, a fruit from God. The culminating point of the blessing given to Abraham. I saw that Joachim could not comprehend these words. Then the angel led him behind the curtain that concealed the grating before the Holy of Holies. The space between the curtain and the grating afforded standing room. Then the angel held up before Joachim's face a shining ball that reflected like a mirror. Joachim breathed upon it and gazed into it. When I saw the angel holding the ball so close to Joachim's face, I thought of a custom in use at our country weddings, where one kisses a painted head and gives fourteen pennies to the sexton. And now, as if called up by the breath of Joachim, appeared all kinds of pictures in the globe. He saw them clearly, for his breath did not dim them. It seemed to me that the angel then said to him that Anne should conceive, although remaining just as unsullied by him, as this ball. The angel then took it from Joachim and raised it on high. I saw it hovering in the air and, as if through an opening, innumerable and wonderful pictures went into it. They were like a whole world, one picture growing out of another. Up in the highest point appeared the Most Holy Trinity, and below, to one side, were Paradise, Adam and Eve, the Fall, the Promise of a Redeemer, Noah, the Ark, scenes connected with Abraham and Moses, the Ark of the Covenant, and numerous symbols of Mary. I saw cities, towers, gateways, flowers, all wonderfully connected together by beams of light like bridges. They were all assaulted and combated by beasts and spirits, which, however, were everywhere beaten back by the streams of light that burst upon them.